Welcome to Season 2 of the Making Bank Podcast, where we continue our exploration of South Florida's entrepreneurial landscape with host Keith Costello, co-founder and CEO of Locality Bank. Sit back, relax, and let South Florida visionaries guide you on an entrepreneurial journey from tribulation to triumph, sharing the very stories that have shaped them. Lisa Ludolf Perlo, welcome to Locality Bank's Making Bank podcast. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. We're really excited to have you join us. It's a little different of a podcast because normally we're taking entrepreneurs and telling their story about somebody who started a business from scratch. It's a little bit of a different story because we're really talking about an entrepreneur, somebody who started out very early on in a company and grew to become really running that company uh, and a multi-billion dollar company. So uh, this is a woman who's achieved great success and is in the interesting part of it. And the other part of the story is now doing some entrepreneurial things. That's right. So writing books right. and doing some consulting and, and doing a lot of cool things, which we'll talk about at the end. But it was such an interesting story and it's brought to me by my good friend, Steve Nudelberg, who was a previous uh, podcast guest. And I said, you know, yes, this is, uh, this is something we wanna talk about with everybody. So your current role as Vice Chairman of External Affairs at Royal Caribbean Group. Yes. Um, and previously you were the President and CEO of Celebrity Cruises. I was, yes. For, from 2014 to 2023. Yeah, nine so years. A long nine run. years, a long wow. run, a great run. Yes. Well, we're going to unpack everything a little bit and and uh, and talk about all your experiences because a lot of those are going to be valuable to our to our audience because we have people who listen who are entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So, uh, going back to uh, your early childhood because there's always something there that that we find as we talk to people, there's something in their childhood and their upbringing yeah. that kind of creates this drive, this, uh, this urge to be a leader, this urge to do something significant. So tell us about growing up in Gloucester. Gloucester, Massachusetts. Yeah. yeah the oldest Which I can say because I'm from Albany, there so you I can go. actually All right. pronounce it. Can so. you, yeah. Well, it's the <laughs> oldest seaport in the United States, celebrating 400 years this year, which is really cool. Um, and my parents, uh, had restaurants there when I was growing up and as a fishing town, every, pretty much everyone I grew up with was either Italian or Portuguese <laughs> and their dads were fishermen and their granddads were fishermen. Wow. And as we all got older, my classmates became fishermen. It's just what you did in Gloucester. My family was a little different. We weren't Portuguese or Italian. We aren't, and we weren't fishermen, but we had restaurants and coffee shops. And I always find it serendipitous that I ended up in a career hospitality on the oceans. Yeah. When, right? And, uh, you know, you when you look back and you think about how did you end up here? Well, maybe it's not that crazy that I ended up here. But people ask me, as you just did, how did I start? When did I know? People say, when did you become a leader? It's when I was two. Wow. And That's early. it's when my first sister was born. And I don't know, for some reason, I thought I was the boss from the minute she was born and that it was my job to take care of her and lead her and help her and encourage her and help her do the things she needed to do. And that's just the role I took on. And then my other sister was born when I was 14. I started working in my parents' coffee shop when I was six, wow. standing on an upside down milk crate, <laughs> making change for customers. And when I got into school, when the nuns, I went to Catholic school, had to leave the room, they always put me in charge, which was kind of cool because I was really young and they were putting me in charge, but it didn't make me very popular with the rest of the kids. So <laughs> well, there's a lesson there, right? Yeah, there Sometimes you go. when you're the leader, you're not going to be the most popular That's person, right. right. That's right. That's <laughs> right. So it started when I was very young and I guess I just liked it. And um, then it just kept growing from there. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And so yeah, that drive, that, that yeah. uh, you know, desire to lead early on and, and yeah. experienced in your, in your family's restaurants and so then you decide you're going to go to college yeah. and you went to Bentley yes, University. for so, accounting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So for accounting. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. How boring. How, did How you boring, <laughs> right? But I was really good at it. I, oh. I was always good in math and that's uh, why I went okay. to school for accounting. Um, and I will tell you, it 
was invaluable in my career, ending up in my career, right? But um, as CEO, understanding P&Ls and EBITDA and everything, margins, everything we had to learn. But I was putting myself through school, waitressing, and every, you know, your customers would say, so what are you going, what are you studying? Accounting. And everybody shook their head and said, no, you are not an accountant. <laughs> and I was a little offended by that. What are you going to question my choice? And, um, but they were right. But I've used it in everything that I've done. And I ended up just going in a different direction in hospitality, again, um, I always look at my career as a series of things that happened that I didn't expect and didn't plan. But sometimes I think that might be where you end up the best, right? When yeah. you don't know where it's all going to take you. So what did happen? Um, after I got out of college and knew that I wasn't going to be an accountant and that hospitality was really in my blood, I worked in different hotels within uh, Massachusetts at that time. It was called the Computer Belt. Wang Digital Prime Computer. I know I'm dating myself, but this is where they all started, you know, <laughs> yeah. in Massachusetts. Yeah. And I was selling event space, convention space, trade show space. But I was finding that hotels were getting a little small and that I wasn't really loving the industry. And I was thinking about what I wanted to do next. So it was a Sunday morning, dating myself again. I was looking through the Boston Globe and the health wanted section because LinkedIn was not available at the time. <laughs> Indeed, wasn't Indeed, around. Indeed, right? it wasn't around. Yeah, no, kids, none of this. A lot of people, I I'm with you. I mean, that's <laughs> where you. You know, I found a lot of jobs that way. <laughs> Thank too, you. So. <laughs> uh, so I found this job that was quite interesting, had no experience in it, but that didn't stop me. And it was selling cruises for a big travel company in Massachusetts at the time. And I said, what the hell? You know, why not? Yeah. Uh, learn something new. I'm a learner and I when I thought it would be fun. And so I applied for that job and got that job. And about a year, a year and a half later, uh, someone from our company back in 1985 came into our location and said, I just got promoted. My job is available. If anyone's interested, you should send in your resume. And that's what I did. And, you know, it was a long story about not getting hired the first time, going back, not taking no for an answer. And finally they hired me. <laughs> and uh, that was May of 1985. And I will leave the company in April of 2024. So that's wow. a 39 year career in wow. the same company doing so it's many incredible. different things. I mean, how many people have that kind of longevity, especially nowadays? Yeah. I mean, people seem to move around so yeah. much. That it's unheard of that's, That is yeah. incredible. So tell me about the industry back then though. Yeah. Uh, so were... You know, in terms of male dominated, was it or was it were there a lot of, of females in that business as well? Or it depended on uh -huh. where you were in the business. Okay. So I was in sales and marketing for my first 21 years. And there were a lot of women in sales mm -hmm. and marketing, a lot of women in leadership roles throughout the industry in our company. A lot of the salespeople that I worked with were women. Um, but then when I uh, but there are other parts of the industry still and certainly back then that were only men. Uh, all the leadership, all the CEOs, um, all the big companies were run by men. The entire operation, Marine and Hotel, run by men. So in 2005, when I went into an operational role for Celebrity Cruises, I had spent my um, first 21 years at Royal at the Royal Caribbean brand, okay. international brand, and I moved over to run um, hotel operations for Celebrity. I was tapped by the uh, pre then president of Celebrity, who I had worked for at Royal Caribbean in sales and marketing. And then I realized it really hit me in the face how there were no other women. And I was the only one. And it wasn't very comfortable for me. It wasn't a very welcoming environment back then. But I found a way. I navigated my way, pardon that bad pun, but I navigated my way <laughs> through. I helped change a culture, which is really a great legacy that I have had throughout my career. Um, and used it to my advantage in every way that I could. So talk about that a little bit, because I think one of the things, we've had some, some female entrepreneurs on here and have talked about some of the obstacles that they yeah. faced and, and how they overcame them. I want you to talk about that a little bit. Well, I have found as you are bumping into skepticism or people that don't believe you deserve to be where you are, 
who don't give you credit for what you've accomplished, who might think you're there for some other reason other than you've worked really hard and been really good at what you do, or you've started a company because you're really smart. Uh, I found that you have to, there's nothing you can do about that. That is just the way it is. However, you can change how people think about you, how they feel about you, um, the respect you get, one interaction at a time. And I have a chapter in my book, which you briefly mentioned, that is sort of a mantra in my career. And it's uh, the title of the chapter is Watch Me Prove You Wrong. And I have throughout my career in every situation and position that I've been put in where people have questioned why I'm there, I have proved people wrong every single day with every decision I make and everything that I do. Wow. And do, so proving people wrong could backfire, right? Depending on how you do it, you know, like rubbing somebody's nose in your success is not going to, yeah. So talk about how you, how do you prove somebody wrong and and still come out having them like you? (laughs) Sure. Well, and let me tell you something. I know people say, you know, it's not my job to be liked. I don't care if people like me. Well, you know, maybe it's a gender thing. Let me change thing. that to respect you. Okay. Because sure. that's more important okay. than being like, sure. right? Okay. Go ahead. Well, change I would it. just say, how did oh. you do that with still gaining respect? Yep. Um, and not necessarily always being liked because, right. yeah, that's true. Right. It's right. You can't always be liked as No, you can't. It doesn't hurt, though. I will tell you that. Yeah. But that's, I think the, the thing that I learned is that people want great leaders, And if you are a great leader and you helped them succeed and you admit you're not there to do their job, you don't know as much about their job as they do. You know, when I was leading captains and they were looking at me like, what are you doing as, you know, why are you my boss? You've never driven a ship. You've never fixed an engine. You've never pulled in and out of a port. And my answer is no, I never have. And I respect you and and everything that you know that I don't know. All I am here is to support you, help you, lead you, guide you, make your job easier, and then we're all going to be successful. And it immediately changes how people feel about you. That's, that is great advice. I'm listening to you saying this as a CEO myself. That That is just really good advice to anybody, an entrepreneur or anybody right. who's leading any type of, right. an, any leader anywhere. Uh, to to be able to let people know that you're there to support, help them, coach them, that that's really your main right. role, right? Right. It is. It's not to Make do their job. Make them successful. Exactly. It's to empower them to be the best they can be and um, give them every tool they need to be ult- unbelievably successful because at the end of the day, that made me successful throughout my entire career, just surrounding myself with great people and showing them they, the respect that they deserved. And in turn, I got the respect. You know, when I was, uh, when I first went into operations and I walked on a ship, it was a weird experience for me. And it was hard for me to accept the culture because it's very militaristic in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. It's stripe based. You know, you start at the bottom and you have a certain amount of stripes and then you're the captain and you've got four and a half stripes. And, and, and that's where you think your respect comes from. And it took me a long time to, change the culture to convince people that respect is earned. It's not based on the number of stripes on your sleeve or your well, shoulder. Well, I served in the military. Yeah. And that was always something that I would say also, like, don't respect me right. because I'm wearing a bar That's right. or so many stripes. No. It, it has to be earned. That's and right. I think uh, otherwise it's it's uh, it's not really leadership, no. right? No. Nope. So tell us, as you mentioned, a captain. So you had Captain Katie McHugh, Captain Katie, who you hired, yes. who was the first woman captain, yeah. right? First American woman okay. ever. Um, and still the only, I um, appointed Captain Kate in 2015. She is still the only American woman uh, who is the captain of a mega cruise ship. And she wow. was the first woman captain for Celebrity. Uh, she, We have staff captains. We also have an Ecuadorian uh, woman who's the captain in the Galapagos, uh, Captain Nathalie. So we have uh, many in the pipeline now, but yes, Captain Kate McHugh, you know, when you look back at your career and you think about moments that were transformational um, and really changed things forever, it was the appointment of Captain Kate. 
Wow. Uh, yes. That is, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, that must have really, what, in what year was that? 2015. She. It was July of 2015. I was appointed as president and CEO in December of 14. I met her at Royal Caribbean. She was a staff captain. Okay. She came to a conference um, that I was leading because I was the executive vice president of operations at the time. Many staff captains came to these conferences because all of the captains couldn't come because they were driving the ships and they were navigating ships around the world. So they would select certain staff captains. And that's, um, I believe life is a series of connections that we make that we never truly understand at the time. And I met Captain Kate. She took time to come up to me and talk to me about how happy she was a woman was at, you know, in this leadership role, how she believed in everything I was doing for the culture. And just in that brief conversation, I knew she was really special. And I kept talking to the man in charge of the captains. And we had a few openings uh, come up as captains retired or we brought new ships in. We needed more captains. And I would continue to ask him, when is Kate going to get her turn? And he kept telling me her time will come. Well, I was then appointed to president and CEO of Celebrity. Her time never came at Royal Caribbean. So I thought maybe I should call Captain Kate and see if she would be interested in joining me on this great adventure. And she said, hell yes. <laughs> and um, just as a the last part, first of all, she's yeah. the most followed mariner in the world. Over wow. 3 million uh, social media really? connections, wow. followers. Yes. It's, so post this insane. on, get her to post this on her uh, Yes, I'll have social. to send her a snippet. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, she's always such a big part of my story. But her, um, the best part of that story is I spoke to her, I think in April maybe, and I told her, you know, she had to finish her contract and then take vacation. So she couldn't join us until July. And I wanted to make a big splash again. I'm sorry for the <laughs> silly <laughs> puns. And I said, but we can't talk about this until July because I really want to make a big deal out of this. So she said, okay, but can I tell my dad? And I said, sure, you can tell your dad. So she took the email that I sent her, thanking her for accepting, coming, and how great she was going to be, et cetera. And she put it in a card. And she gave her dad the Father's Day card and she signed it, Captain Kate. So he was reading it. And then she had her phone, of course, because that's what Kate does. And she was recording him. She said, all of a sudden, the tears started rolling down his face. Oh, wow. And she said, thank you for allowing me to share that with him on Father's Day because it meant so much to him. And I get goosebumps telling the story, but I think for me... Um, these are the moments in my career that have been the most special. Not so much that my wildest dreams came true. They weren't even my dreams. They, they, they happened and I never expected them, but it's what I've been able to do to help others achieve their dreams. You made somebody else's dreams come That's true. That's right. And that yeah. for me is the most rewarding thing. Wow. Yeah. So leadership is, is so critical for entrepreneurs, for yes. CEOs, for mm -hmm. anybody and, and I, anybody in any leadership role, right? right? A nonprofit or right. anybody in an organization. So, and leadership, a lot of times, as you said, I, I agree. I mean, that comes down to helping people and, and, and being able to help people really perform their best, almost like a coach, mm -hmm. uh, a lot like a coach, really. What are your critical values that you believe in? I know you have some. Uh, it's... Um I had I have a set of leadership values. There are nine different values that, you know, always doing the right thing, find a way or make a way, play as a team. You know, that for me is probably I use a lot of sports analogies because I think sports are, you know, the greatest example of winning together versus individually. I think you see the greatest teams achieving the greatest long-term success when they play as a team. And it's not about one star or one person who thinks they're better or bigger or the reason that the team is doing well. And I always believe that that's something that I hire people who want to be part of a team and who aren't so centered on their own ego that... Um, they're more interested in their own success versus the greater good and the greater success. And then the other thing I think that's really important to me is the first, I, my values never had a particular order except number one, which is um, nurture our employees. And I, 
I talk a lot about the boomerang theory because I believe as a leader and as a human being, we get back what we give. And when you look at the cruise industry and you think about all the different, 71 different countries where people come from, they're on those ships anywhere from three to six to nine to 12 months. They're away from their friends. They're away from their families. And they're giving everything they have to our guests and to each other. And I think that I really learned the empathetic and caring part of leadership when I came into operations in 2005. And I wanted all of those 20,000 crew members to know that I genuinely cared about them. And I believe that that garnered their genuine care for me. And I believe as a leader, the discretionary effort you get from that is priceless. Wow. So talk to us about building a brand because Mm. that's part of of what you did as well, right? Yes, yes. I came into Celebrity in 2005. It was always the challenger brand in our company. And people thought I was crazy to leave the big machine brand of Royal Caribbean with so much consumer awareness and, you know, drives the most profitability in the company and a brand I helped build for 21 years. Why would you leave Royal Caribbean and go to Celebrity? And I did it for a lot of different reasons that were very personal for me and very much how I'm wired. And I wanted to go somewhere where I could make the biggest difference. I didn't want to add incremental value. I wanted to add transformational value. So I choose, and I was offered the same job on both brands the same day by both brand presidents. And I couldn't believe that was happening because for my Up until that point, my entire career, this is what I was waiting for. And I I thought, why are you guys doing this to me? You know, you're both going to do, you know, make me this offer on the same day and make me choose. It was a, oh my goodness, I'll never forget that. But I had to go to the, you know, the head of Royal Caribbean and say, I'm choosing this celebrity job. And he's the one who said, are you crazy? And (laughs) I said, maybe I am, but it's the right move for me. And I think I can really make a difference. And that was the first time I was with celebrity. It was seven years running operations. And then I, when I came back as CEO, it put me in such a great position to understand what the brand really needed. It needed to be recognized. It needed the respect it deserved. It needed to be a brand to be reckoned with. It needed to grow. It needed to transform itself from a brand that probably didn't really know what its identity was to developing a strong identity and a strong position in the market. And for the nine years that I was there, the team and I worked to accomplish all of that. And it was, you know, it was it was great uh, bringing that brand to the top of the heap and carving out a beautiful niche for us in the industry. And as you told me, as we were talking before, not a billion dollar business, but a multi, multi, multi billion dollar business. Yeah. That that, that you built really there. Um, And, you know, it was, again, watch me prove you wrong. I remember standing in a board meeting, one of, in my early days of being appointed to this role. And, you know, the board was less than thrilled with the performance of the brand over a very long period of time, it had nothing to do with me. I was brand new. I was just, I was just taking it over. And, uh, you know, I, I remember thinking when I walked out of that room, um, you know, they were again, skeptics, it's not going to happen. And even when I got the position, I thought to myself, another, another chapter in my book, be careful what you wish for, because (laughs) I was thinking, what makes you think you're going to do this when so many before you have met with, you know, not not the success that they had hoped for, the board had hoped for. And it was just a really good feeling when I was finally able to stand up in front of the board in 2017. I'll never forget that meeting where I was, I did my presentation, I was getting ready to sit down. And one of the board members said, hold on, Lisa, um, you know, I just want to tell you that for 20 years or maybe 25 at the time, we've been waiting for celebrity to accomplish these results and you finally did it. Congratulations. Wow. And that for me was um, a big, a big deal and a big moment. One that I obviously remember word for word, so I'll never <laughs> forget it. Those are big words. <laughs> Those are big words from a very critical board member. Well, what was the story? Because this is going to help everybody, yeah. right? What's the story you told yourself when you were having those doubts, when you got in there and you said, why am I going to be able to do this when nobody else could? What'd you, 
How did you power through that? Well, you know, listen, I believe that life, the experiences that we have in our career and our lives are you have to tap into those. One of the great things for me is it was 30 years in the industry by the time I was appointed to this role. And some people say, you waited 30 years. I'm like, yeah, I waited 30 years. And I, I believe timing, you know, I, I don't, I believe that everything happens for a reason. So I believe that 30 years later, me getting that position after all the experience I had in sales, in marketing, in operations, marine operations, logistics, it's a tough, complicated business. And every bit of experience I had led me to where I got and then helped me determine what is it that I need to do for this brand that's really going to make it stand out. Because I had a very good understanding of the competition. I had a very good understanding of what the brand was versus what I thought it could be. Because again, sales, marketing, consumer insights, research, those were all part of my background. And I knew there was a place for this brand that we just needed to get it to with the right team of people that was going to help me get it there. So I think that the experience that you gain, sometimes it takes a little time, but I don't think people should look at that as a negative. Take every experience that you um, have, everything that you learn, and eventually you're going to use it, whether you're starting your own business or an you know, entrepreneur or an entrepreneur or, you know, just a corporate person forever. It's it never hurts and it really helps you build a foundation that's going to contribute to your success. Wow. Well, again, that's that's uh, really, really good advice for, for everybody. Um, when you talk, like you were obviously a good leader and you mentored probably a lot of people. Who did you go to? Tell us about a mentor or somebody who coached you that was meaningful in your career. I think, well, I've had, um, I've never had a woman mentor. And I have, um, and I've had sponsors and advocates, and I believe those are the most important people to have. People who are invested in your success and who have the gravitas and the influence to help you get there. And I had a few of those people in my career, and probably the um, the one that was. Uh, two, I would say two. One who put me on a journey to where I ended up, but I went kicking and screaming because sometimes you don't know what's right for you. Uh -huh. And other people see things in you that you probably don't see things in yourself. So I had a path and I had a dream and it was to be the head of sales. And I worked 17 years in progressive positions to get there. And I was just waiting for my boss to say he was done so that I could just glide into his role. And then one day, the senior vice president of sales and marketing moved me out of sales and put me into marketing. And I felt like it was the end of my dream and the end of my career. He was moving me aside to move me out. Little did I know that that was the first of many moves that contributed to me becoming president and CEO of Celebrity. And even to this day, he said, do you remember when I moved you kicking and screaming from sales into marketing? And I say, yes, you know, because uh, I rolled my eyes. And he said, how'd that work out for you? <laughs> and, but he was the person who tapped me to come to Celebrity in 2005 and run hotel operations. So he really moved me around and helped me learn and develop um, a lot of the leadership skills that I developed over time and I'm still developing, but also learning the business enough that it would put me in this position. And then when I finally got the position, our chairman and CEO, uh, Richard Fain was then the, the one that really, I guess was a mentor because he really, um, you know, I think he put me in the position thinking I would do well, but not being quite sure. Another watch me prove you wrong thing that I knew and I had to, you know, that's motivation for me. It's, you know, that, that, that gets my fire going. Um, but he really helped me as well. And, um, because, you know, that's like going from high school to grad school. Right. 
You know, when you're running a multi-billion dollar business, you have to transform a brand. You know, the board isn't happy with the performance. And, you know, that, that was, that was, or maybe even PhD and, <laughs> and you need help along the way. And that's another thing. I've never been afraid to ask for help. And I think that's a sign of strength, not a sign of weakness. And I think a lot of people look at it as a sign of weakness and that's a big mistake. Wow. Again, great advice. So let's shift gears a minute and talk about philanthropy because I know yes. you are involved and you're philanthropic, you give back. Talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, I believe that uh, it's our obligation and responsibility to give back and to lend a voice and a hand to those who need one. So I have used a good portion of my time. I'm the chair of the United Way of Broward County Board, and I've been a part of the board for uh, almost 15 years now in one way or another. I have, um, I've been on the International Board of Best Buddies, which is for the intellectually challenged um, and run by Anthony Shriver. And we hired buddies in our company. And it was, it's just a beautiful thing to watch and see and help these amazing young adults uh, contribute to society in a in a way that is is so great for them and makes them productive and it, that was just wonderful. I've built homes for Habitat for Humanity, um, so I yeah so I give back as much as I possibly can. And thank you for that. And uh, actually, with the United Way, you hosted uh, an event at your home, which I attended. Yes, which the was Tocqueville event. Yes, yeah, it was, yes, it was, it was a beautiful nice. event. Yeah, it thank was you lovely. For doing that. It's always my pleasure. So now you've had this amazing executive career, corporate career, entrepreneur. Now you're taking a little shift. And I am. You've uh, you've written a book, yeah. which. Uh, you yeah, I did. Show it's, us um, here. Yeah, there Making you go. Waves. Making waves. And it's a perfect title for the book and a perfect title for me. Um, a woman's rise to the top using smarts, heart, and courage. Um, and it takes a lot of all of those things for sure to uh, make it to the top. And when is the book being released? February 20th, 2024, uh, available for pre-sale now oh, really? uh, on okay. Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and it will be also available in local bookstores as well. Wow. Yeah, so it's exciting. If you want to get more in depth, we, obviously this is a, a woman who has a great deal of knowledge and, and really great stories to share about uh, her career. And I'm sure we can only capture so much in a podcast, but yeah. there's probably a lot more depth and I'm, I'm definitely going on and I'm going to get a pre-order in today. So, uh, and I would recommend our listeners to do that also. Thank you. Um, and, and so obviously, so we have books that we have from every podcast guest okay. that they recommended. Oh, cool. Yep. So this will be Obviously, this is going to be the one we're already selecting this for you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so we will have this available here for right. people that, that want to borrow the book. We have a little library that we have for, for anybody who uh, wants to come and, and, uh, and read these books. So It's a leadership book. And I think if people are thinking about being a leader or starting a business, I hope there are lessons in there that people will take away. I tell um my lessons through stories. It's not a memoir. It really is just the things I learned along my way that I think had really helped build a business and make me a great leader. And, um, and I did learn them, you know, not all of them were, you know, innate and, uh, many are leaders. I do believe are born. And, uh, but I do believe we're also fine tuning ourselves every step of the way. Yes. Nature and nurture, right? Yeah. So. All right, so now we're going to shift yep. to the lightning round where we just okay. ask a bunch of, oh, okay. no lightning's going to hit you or anything. No, it's okay, just, okay. Uh, but we're going to go to like some quick questions okay. that just wrap up and lets everybody get a little more personal knowledge about about you. Favorite book? <laughs> Making Waves. Well, Making Waves, got to be my fav <coughs> favorite book. I can't pick a different book other right, than Making exactly. Waves. So right. I answered that one for you. Thank you. Do you have a song from your youth? So I'm thinking we grew up around the same time. So. Yeah. And, yeah. and Noodleberg, he's over yeah. here. He's, he's our era too, so. Yeah. Helen Reddy, I Am Woman. Whoa. I love that <laughs> song. And I play it even now when I really want to, because okay. it's, it's so appropriate then and so appropriate now. Oh, I bet there's a lot of listeners who can relate to that. Or yeah. who don't even know what it is. So go, yeah, go, <laughs> go YouTube it. <laughs> exactly. Spotify that song and, and get that on your playlist. There you go. Best piece of advice you've ever received? Was from a coach, a man, 
Cloudy Jules. I'll never forget Cloudy. He actually texted me the other day and said, I still, I see you're still, you know, shaking it up. Best piece of advice. If you want to change, you can't change the conversation unless you have a seat at the table. Mm, that's great. I've also heard the saying that uh, if you're not at the table, you, you're on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> wow. No way. That's a little wow. harsher, but <laughs> that's very harsh. <laughs> um, so AI, do you and I don't want to get into a big discussion no, about no, no. AI. No. Just as quick Lightning, either, yeah. either do you think it's good for a humanity or are you more concerned that it's a threat to humanity? Both. How about both? Just you like everything, social media. Great for humanity, not so great. You know, AI, great, not so great. Everything yeah. has its pluses and minuses. That's a good answer. If you could have dinner with anyone, living or dead, and I want to say outside of family, because yep. everybody yep. has a family member probably that's deceased that they would mm -hmm. like to see again, uh, but a, a famous person or Ruth, not famous person. Ruth Bader's, Bader Ginsburg. Wow. Okay. That's, uh, that's an excellent choice. Yep. Quite uh, an impressive woman. Yep. Uh, what's something you're grateful for today? Everything. Everything. I'm grateful for everything. I wake up grateful every day. Wow. Yeah. That's great. That's really, uh, and I felt that. That was in a, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, this is kind of an unfair question for you, but what's your favorite travel destination? You've probably been oh, everywhere. Oh, my but. favorite. Okay, <laughs> it's gotta be Italy. Oh. The food, the history, the coastline, the wine, the people. I mean, everything. Wow. Yeah, Italy. That's awesome. It's got it all going on. Who's someone you admire and why, other than Ruth Bader Ginsburg? Oh my gosh. Um, Amanda Gorman. You know that young woman, uh, poet, who spoke at the inauguration, um, whose book is banned here? I just, that, that young woman, I, you know, I admire young people so much for their courage and their wisdom. And she's someone that I'm so impressed by. I tried to get her to be the godmother of one of our ships, but she was too famous at the time. <laughs> she's, she's just awesome. Oh, that's great. How about a favorite movie? Oh my gosh, a favorite movie. Oh. Um, what's the movie? Okay. Oh, it's a, it's a Christmas movie. It's a holiday movie with um, Hugh Grant and Emma Thompson. Oh, help me. Anyone? Anybody? Know oh my one? gosh. Fine. Yes, fine. <laughs> Ryan's going to find it. Love Actually. I love Love Actually. Great movie. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, Ryan. No, <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. He's, he's awesome. He is awesome. So now, what are some new things you're learning? Oh, my gosh. So I learned, you know, why I say using smarts, heart, and courage as part of my book. And here's what I learned. I learned it takes courage to start a new chapter literally and figuratively. When I decided that it was time to walk away from something I'd done for 39 years and a job I loved and a brand I loved, it was for so many reasons. Clearly I'm of the age that it's time to, you know, I'm, I'm the average age of retirement. So that was not an issue. Yeah. Okay. I'm old enough. But when you are so wrapped up in something that you, you, you know, it defines you. It's who you are. It's not just what you do. It's who you are. And you decide you're going to do something different. And I thought about it for quite a few years. You know, COVID hit our industry extraordinarily right. hard. And I had to be an entrepreneur all over again, starting from zero, starting those ships up again from right. zero. I lost my sister during COVID. Sorry. Thank you. Tough. But I learned that there's something more. And there are other things in life and one thing doesn't define you. And that our, we have an opportunity every single day 
to go write a new chapter. And I knew it was time for me to write my new chapter. So that's what I learned. And now I'm learning how to do it. Just like so many of your guests and so many of your listeners, I'm learning how to do it. And it's exciting and fun to be learning to do something different and start your own thing and do your own thing and only do what you love and what you're passionate about. And my husband and my sister tell me every day, slow the hell down. And I'm like, do you know who I am? That's just (laughs) not possible yet. Um, But yeah, I'm just learning that life is one great adventure. And you just keep having to, you get the opportunity to figure out something new every day. That's great. And I think, you know, we do have listeners probably out there who are going into another phase, right? Where they've been defined by a role and now it's a different role or something else and at any stage along the way, right? Right. That can happen. So I think, uh, you know, I congratulate you. A lot of people will say after a successful career, like you've had, Hey, I'm putting my feet up. I'm going to you know kick back, relax and uh, play tennis or golf. And, but I don't see that happening with you. No. So. <laughs> not yet. Not at all. I'm done with no. that chapter. I'm, I'm done never. with that, but not done. How's that? Yeah. Well, how can people get in touch with you? Uh, LisaLutoffPerlo.com. Okay. And visit my website and all of my information is there. And uh, I welcome I welcome the outreach. And don't forget, making waves. Making waves. Yes. Order it today. Get that there you button. go. Thank you so much, Lisa. This Thank has been you, amazing been and uh, really a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thanks for tuning in to Locality's Making Bank podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform to catch the latest episodes and visit localitybank.com today to learn more about all the benefits of banking local. Thank you.